Well, hello. Nice. It's great to see you guys. And I'm excited this morning as we continue in our summer season of teaching where we've been inviting in guest voices from around the city to come and talk around the theme of God on the move to get to tell you that we have Landon Lynch here today. I expected that. Uh, For many of you, there's really no introduction needed, but some of you maybe have not yet met Landon. And so I just want you to know that Landon served on staff here for several years as the teaching and adult ministries pastor. Is that the right title? Um, And also, I'm going to mention this because I feel like this still comes up regularly in conversation for me. He created and led a space called Tuesdays in the Chapel. Did anybody get to do that? Yes. I feel like... This comes up for me quite a bit, where people tell me how important and meaningful this space was for them, and kind of the, the, the dynamic of growth and the opportunity to um, think about self-awareness and about God in that space has been really huge for people, and actually I think is a pretty accurate reflection of who Landon is and, and what his giftings are. Uh, since leaving DCC, Landon has ventured into the Um, consulting and kind of leadership development world. He founded an organization called Motive People Strategies, and he partners with uh, Giant Worldwide, if you're familiar with that organization. And really, I think if you could sum up, I think what Landon is up to, and probably even really what he was doing here, is that he helps organizations to prosper by helping the people within those organizations to prosper. So if you would, help me to welcome up Landon Lynch. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Uh, well, it's, it's really good to get to be here. It always is. Um, for those of you I haven't met, like Becca said, I'm Landon. Uh, and it's this, uh, this place is always really unique, getting to be on staff here some years ago. I remember my first time preaching on this stage and being blown away at just the, the visual of you all with this glass and this history in the background. Um, and it's always just so good to be back in this room with this group of people. This community contributed so much for me when it came to my experience and my perspective and leading and being led uh, alongside so many of you. It always creates this kind of sense of homecoming for me whenever I'm here. So um, I'm really grateful for that. And so let's just, uh, let's just start by pausing together. And, uh, and we'll just let this, this prayer that I actually got to pray just a couple of nights ago at a wedding um, just be uh, what centers us together as we get started. And so we're grateful to you, God for all of life, for our intense desire to live fully, and we're grateful to you for the mystery that is love when it's lived out, and for our intense desire to love well. And so thank you, God, for those people that we walk in here with today, for those friends and family who stake their claim in our heart and refuse to let go. for those adversaries of ours who disturb us, who expose our egos, and help increase our resiliency. For the beauty of the natural world just outside that is so compelling, but never fancy, reminding us that we need little and have much. And for those peaceful moments of quiet, away from the near violent requests for our attention where we can just be and where we can remember that before anything we could do or anything we could accomplish in this time together that you, God, are pleased with us. May we live and love well out of that remembrance. No one to impress here today. Nothing to prove. Nothing to hide. Just gratitude here and now. Amen. So, I had this immediate response when Michael first told me the context for today being about uh, finding places where God is on the move. My very first thought, this is just honest, was, man, he better be. Have you looked around? Like, God better be. 
It's so easy to see places, I think, when we look around, and Chad just kind of mentioned it, where God seems so absent or where his, like, God's presence is so needed, uh, right? War overseas, climate change, dictators holding the world's food supply hostage, political bickering, twisted information and propaganda around every corner, incessant violence that only seems to ignite more political bickering, and that COVID thing just seems to be the new normal Enter monkeypox. Just for a twist, right? Because COVID was getting boring. Anybody feel that way? And my second thought was God's movement so often seems most evident to me, and maybe in the world, when a group of people, maybe like this group of people, discover freedom in unexpected places. And all of the context that we just mentioned would be a pretty unexpected place in my mind for God to show up, which makes me wonder, might it be possible that we're ripe for God's movement right now? And in recent months, one of the places that I've watched the most people unexpectedly encounter freedom is in the recovery of desire and discipline. A uh, recovering desire in a really hard season, I think, probably makes sense for most of us. That would be my guess. Like, yeah, we need to recover some desire right now instead of just survival and holding on and buttoning up. Like, let's, let's get some desire going again. But discipline as freedom, I would imagine, often feels like more of a stretch, even kind of a desire buzzkill, if we're honest. Uh, and, and yet I find it really fascinating that Jesus and those who seem to be the most tapped into that Jesus perspective, the people who seem to be kind of soaking up that life to the full thing that he always talks about, those people seem to be the people who most shamelessly desire things, just shamelessly embrace and name what they desire and also joyfully discipline their lives. And in the church world, it's not uncommon to hear people speak about these, this life that's modeled after Jesus as one that finds freedom in the midst of tension. And I've been told in my kind of time growing up in church on not just one occasion to get really comfortable living in the tension. Anybody heard that? Anybody just been struggling, dripping, like you're like, I'm going to start sweating blood like Jesus soon, like that's how I'm feeling about the tension, and somebody's like, get comfortable with that. It's what Jesus and following Jesus and Christianity is all about. You're like, awesome. Great, sign me up for more. And it seems to be the most seemingly absurd interactions that Jesus has or the things that he says that really puts freedom on display the most for me. And I, I, I love the account in uh, Luke chapter 18. And Jesus is like 19 miles away from Jerusalem. So Jerusalem, we all know what goes down in Jerusalem. For those of us that might be like Jerusalem, haven't heard of that. Give me one second. That's where Jesus gets killed. So He's coming up to this place where he knows he's this man on a mission. He's got one thing in mind. He's getting there. And Jericho, this town about 19 miles away, is kind of his last chance, so to speak, his last hurrah to put all like this exclamation mark on things to really ready his disciples, these people that are following him, these people that want to live life like he does, to like stamp it and put some neon lights around the things that they're going to need to be ready for what's coming next for them, for the tension, for the disorientation, for the fear, for the struggle that is about to land squarely on everybody who loves him most. And so he starts out in this, uh, in this kind of work, as Luke records it, by telling a couple of parables, right? And parables are just these, these stories that put some deep truth uh, on display. And the first one he tells is about this, the quality and the need for persistence and just consistency with God and this persistence in somebody. And then it kind of starkly puts humility and arrogance side by side and says, no worries. Uh, they're going to be shown for what they are in the end. They're going to be exposed. So don't worry. Everything's going to be exposed, which for some people is good news. And for a lot of us, we're like, oh no. 
Um, and then he hangs out with a bunch of kids, and, and he just shows everybody there's this time that he gives to people without any strings attached, and he gives the time to the people who can give him little to nothing amidst all of these powerful people who could potentially give him so much, and he just gives away his time and his energy to people who might not be able to return anything for it. And then he has this really direct conversation in front of all of these followers of his with this wealthy young man about the trap of trying to be separate and superior in your life. And about the trap that is chasing all the things that you can't take with you. And so in the middle of this like life to the full essentials playlist, that he's got going back to back. Uh, It says he's walking into this town called Jericho and he's got this crowd with him in tow and a man, a blind man, calls out from the roadside where he was begging. He hears that Jesus of Nazareth is coming through town and he yells out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me which is a normal cry of a beggar. The have mercy cry is a normal thing that you would hear. The the Jesus son of David part at least indicates that this man believes that Jesus has the capability of giving him something more than what's usual. When you hear have mercy, the, the requirement, the expectation for Jews that were going to the temple was that they would give alms to the poor, which is usually money. Maybe in the case of a rabbi walking by, it would be a blessing. Uh, but he yells out, son of David, have mercy on me, which at least insinuates this guy has a sense that you won't stop at that, will you? You've got, you've got the capacity for more. And all these people tell him to be quiet. All these people say, they rebuke him, they tell him to be quiet, you're embarrassing us. Or, you, know, like, you think about the implications of, oh, this is this guy's first exposure to our town. We don't want him getting screamed at by the likes of you is the feeling that you get here. And so the guy, instead of being quiet, shouts all the louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus, stopping where he is, motions at the people that just rebuked him and told him to be quiet, and all of a sudden transforms these people into this man's escort and says, bring him over to me. And so they get him up, and they bring him to where Jesus is, and Jesus looks him in the eye and says, what do you want me to do for you? which would have been a uh, kind of a ridiculous question even then. And for us now, we're like, it's kind of a given, right? The blind guy coming to you, we know ideally what he's coming to you about. For them, they would have been like alms, give him a blessing, whatever else, nothing more, that's what's expected of you. For us, we all feel justified because Jesus looks at this guy and says, "Uh, what do you want me to do for you? And he says, Rabbi, I just want to see. And then he says, your faith has healed you go. And the man walks away with his sight, and we all, the current day readers, get to feel really justified because we knew how it was going to end. But I I think it's really interesting in those moments where Jesus has these almost uh, absurd or obvious kinds of questions or responses. It's usually a good indicator, and we should get really good when we read Jesus at recognizing there's probably something else going on there. It's pointing to something more true than what's just on the surface. Um, And this ends up being this recurring topic. This isn't a question that Jesus just asks one time. He does it again and again. There's at the beginning of his kind of ministry period, so to speak, these new disciples that want to hang out with him, they're just following him. They haven't even introduced themselves yet. So he's just this rabbi, itinerant teacher, walker, arounder guy. And he's just kind of hoofing it. And then all of a sudden, you just got two little lackeys like hanging out behind you, just kind of watching your every move. And as you do, you turn around finally after you realize they didn't peel off at the last four exits. And and he just says, excuse me, what do you want? Same question. And these guys, maybe the creepiest answer in the entire Bible, go, where are you staying (laughs) <laughs> that should be the end of their relationship, definitely the end of the conversation. Instead, they become best friends. And, 
And then not too long after, uh, he's given this big sermon, Sermon on the Mount, one of his kind of, uh, kind of the grand sermons that he gives. And he tells people again and again, just like he asked the blind man, just like he asks these disciples, he recognizes there's this pivotal moment in front of him. And the thing that he goes after again and again and says straight on in the middle of it is make sure you get clear about what you want and tell God about it. Don't hesitate. Don't hold back on getting really clear about what you desire most and make sure that you tell God just kind of front and center, God, this is what I want. And interestingly, the more that we actually learn today about the way that our brains function, the more essential Jesus' really simple questions end up being. And there's a couple professors, neurobiologists, uh, performance consultants Um, And these guys have done a lot of really great work on kind of just what makes our brains tick. And one of the things that they come back to again and again is to get the best out of ourselves, to live, to even take any kind of a step forward into this life that might be good enough or uh, fulfilling, satisfactory enough that we could call life to the full like Jesus talks about begins with this pursuit of something meaningful, which sounds like a no-brainer. But one of the things they point out is how easy it is for us to broaden our gaze, literally be able to look up and see so many things at once, and it's beautiful, and it's compelling, and it's also paralyzing. And for us and our brains as humans, there's this wonderful act and something that happens internally for us that actually gets us active when we narrow our gaze by asking the question, what do I really want here? What do I really desire? And they put it this way, which is wonderful because this is like so much of the literature that we've talked about in in this church for a long time. But what's your preferred picture of the future? When you actually get a preference front and center, uh, it actually acts as like juice for your wheels and fuel for the energy of the best in you. And Jesus asks, what do you want? Again and again and again. And they say, so make sure uh, you remember that our minds actually operate where we need meaning before details which is an amazing burnout preventer because how many people, when you really go and and ask broadly, how many people get so consumed and distracted with the details first and then they get exhausted by it over the long haul and they say, look, it's actually simple at some level. It's really hard, but it's simple. Reattach yourself to the meaning, the why, what it is that you want frequently And then the details take their proper place again and again and again. The intense complexity of the world can find its place, can find a home and a resting point within your desire. Simon Sinek, if you're familiar with him, built an entire career off of just helping people find their why. Uh, It makes sense when you think about Uh, Jesus was so focused on this and he's speaking to something really deep about the way that we're wired, trying to evoke it and move us toward life to the full, why this guy's work might have gotten such traction. And what's really interesting in all of this is that it's not just when life is good that we get reconnected with it. And actually, when life gets disrupted or thrown to the side, it can be one of the most powerful ways of reattaching ourselves to what we really want. Our brains are hardwired to make meaning out of our experience. There are researchers that actually found when yours and my normal, that life that we expected completely stops making sense. Like in a day, you feel like life just gets tossed. Everything you expected, you have to completely reformulate because of a circumstance. Maybe it was a decision you made. Maybe it was a decision somebody else made for you. Uh, Whatever it was, life gets turned upside down. And actually, what they found is that it ignites. Those moments that are so disruptive and disorienting, oftentimes the ones we wouldn't wish on our worst enemies, have the ability to ignite what they call a superpower inside of us. And all of a sudden, it's like everything within us becomes a meaning-making homing beacon. 
And we begin our ability to be creative, our ability to be open to seeing patterns and possibilities and connections that we might have passed over for years up until that point. The things that we really desire, the things that we really want, rise to the surface and we become more open and malleable and teachable and growable and actually more able to enter into a full life than we were before the disruption. They called it, they actually have a name for it. It's called the Kafka effect. And then they, they decided that they should deem it positive disruption. Anybody ever felt that way about your biggest disruptions? You're like, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and throw this on there. In the moment, very rarely. Five, ten years later, I look back and I'm like, I don't know who I'd be without that. Because disruption has this unique way of making us creative and curious in the honest pursuit of meaning. We become people who find ourselves more eager and able to ask Jesus a simple question. What is it that I really want? Uh, I remember, uh, I remember my, uh, there was the day that we had been kind of working through the process of it and everything, but uh, there was the day that we finally had the conversation uh, where we decided and discussed how my time on staff here would be ending. Um, and the timing of it caught me by surprise. And two hours after that conversation, I was at dinner with Paula Williams. Uh, for those of you that got to hear Paula speak a handful of weeks ago, Paula is, there's wonderful human beings, and then there's Paula. Paula. Uh, and she was helping me lead Tuesdays in the chapel that night uh, back at, at the Wash Park building. And Paula had no idea when we sat down what I had just gone through and what my day had entailed up until that point. But like many of us, uh, whether you knew it was a good thing or not in the end, knowing that there was an end to a job looming and therefore an end to a paycheck and benefits looming, and therefore also a shift in the relationships that had made up your day-to-day -to, -day to that point, and therefore a shift in the routines and rhythms that you'd been, become really accustomed to and didn't really realize that you needed as much as you thought you did, uh, I was disrupted when I sat down to dinner with her. Uh, really, completely shaken, like just to say the least. Uh, what was funny, though, is Paula was really disrupted too, so we were in good company. And... And she had no idea what I was going through. So we spent the first half hour talking about her disruption and where she was coming from and the things that she was learning and leaning into. And we were just sitting there over pizza. And then all of a sudden she goes, how was your day? <laughs> and kind of shock and awe in the moment for her. And she paused and, and she said, hey, I just want you to know I got this tonight. Uh, what do you want? Like, do you want to be there tonight? What, what do you want? Because I can, I can take it. I'll even give him some excuse about how you love him but couldn't be here, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and it was such a kind question. What do you want right now? What do you want? And it was so revealing in the moment because something about what we did together on Tuesday nights, like Becca was talking about, uh, that was exactly where I wanted to be. And until she asked, I actually didn't know that answer. Uh, it was a kind and revealing question because I, I don't know if I would have had such clarity on the importance of that time. I knew I loved it. I knew I loved the people, but the essential importance. And actually, there was nowhere else I really wanted to be that night, even after being thrown for a loop that day. And every single one of us, if we look back over the last few years, we've all been disrupted in so many ways over the past few years. We've all seen people wrestling and trying to make meaning out of the disruption and people asking all new questions about what do I want. And we found out a ton, right? On one hand, outdoor activity skyrocketed over the last few years. I don't know if you saw the stats. I mean, it's like 300, 400% kind of stuff. On the other hand, so did alcohol consumption. 
On one hand, uh, tourism vacationing, like family tourist vacationing and big family gatherings, of course, with COVID, plummeted. And people didn't get to see their big family gatherings except via video very much. But on the other hand, participation in family meals and reading to kids hit new contemporary high points. And one of the places you see the what do I want reflected most drastically, uh, maybe most obviously, is in the labor market. Uh, 40 million people quit their jobs in 2021. I would imagine that means a handful of us quit our jobs in 2021, which is crazy enough until you realize that 36% of the people who quit their jobs quit their jobs without another job in hand. They were just like, I'm done. No, no more. Disruption has a way of really revealing what we want and getting us active. And as it turns out, it can actually be really positive if we're prepared to see it and respond. So that's part one. Um, before we move on, let's take a minute to pause. Uh, if I put you on the spot, and you can pull out your phones, you have permission to pull out your phones if you have no other writing utensil, okay? If you don't have another writing utensil other than your phone in your life, you might want to come up to, to the front at the end and we should talk about that. But uh, phone, whatever you've got, but if I put you on the spot and just asked you today, be present to what you want, what do you really desire, what would you say? Just write it down, this is just for you. And for me, it gets real when I put it into words. So if you're sitting there going, I'm just going to keep it in my head, I'm fine. Rethink that. Um, what do you want? What's most present right now? Some of us, uh, I think it's interesting, you can be writing and I'll just kind of walk us, talk us through this. But some of us, I find, that are really hesitant to write down what we want because it can almost feel criminal to say this is what I want in a world where we're aware of how much we've got um, compared to the world, compared to even people right outside of this building. And the problem isn't the wanting. Oftentimes, it's, I've noticed that it's just that we don't go far enough into what we want, into what we desire. We end up stopping short. So we end up naming and moving towards some superficial thing or somebody else's picture of success that we've adopted for ourselves. And so, if you've named that one thing, here's one easy tool that I use with people all the time, and it's amazing what comes up. It is so simple. But ask why three times. Why do you want what you just wrote down? If you got what you just wrote down, what would that do for you? How would that make your life better? And then just repeat the process, right? I had a friend who uh, was a client for a time, and he, he said, I want to read more books. We were like goal setting at the beginning of the year. Not a really big thing, but he couldn't get off his mind. For whatever reason, he just wouldn't let it go. I'm like, come on, let's be honest. You don't really want to read more books. He's like, no, I really do. Um, and so uh, why, I asked him, like, why would you read a book when you're tired at the end of a long shift uh, instead of streaming whatever show you're looking at after that long day? And he said, well, okay, I want to be a reader. I don't want to be sluggish. Great. Okay. If you aren't so sluggish, uh, what would that do for you? Well, I'd be more focused and I'd be more present. Okay. Where would it matter most for you if you were actually more focused and more present? Why do you want that? And finally, after about six whys, we finally got to the point where he said, you know what, I want to model curiosity and learning for my new young son who was just starting to copy everything he did. I was like, that will get your butt reading a book. So until you find yourself, keep asking why. Just until you find yourself, get as curious about you, at least as curious about yourself as Jesus is. So why three times? Maybe more, but don't stop asking until you can't help doing something about it, right? Just shamelessly desire. And then to flip the script, it's been said that desire without discipline, remember, shamelessly desire and joyfully discipline. It's been said that desire without discipline is fatal. 
So shamelessly desire, but don't stop short. Don't sell yourself short. Don't sell ourselves short. Because it's also been pointed out, and I love this, desire as an end goal in and of itself, just soaking in my desire. I'm like, what do I want today? (laughs) Just soaked in over time has a way of turning into entitlement. It might be why so many followers of Jesus over the century have found themselves wrestling with the then what question. Great, I've got desire, I've got clarity, I think I know what I want, then what? And some of his first followers wrestled with this kind of conundrum of faith. Like, how do we actually go about living life to the full? And, you know, those questions that you begin wrestling with, right? Like, what does faith actually look like lived out in this day, this circumstance? Is it a big, dramatic response? Does it need to be this massive display, this like grand gesture of allegiance to the cross or something? Or is there some kind of a daily reality that grows over time that most might even miss, like if, that your friends might not even know was really going on in you if they didn't know what they were looking for? What, what does it mean about faith for you and me? When the recurring desperate prayers of desire, right? God, I just want, just meet me in the moment. Will you please, reactive, responsive, strong, fervent, but momentary. If those desperate prayers of desire never turn themselves in to daily practices of desire. What does that mean? And one of his followers, uh, James, essentially put his response to those questions into two questions of his own. He's like, look, what do you want? Jesus always asked it, so get clear on that. And then he went for the gut. Like, if you go read James, it's like right out of the bat. He just goes for it. He says, essentially, looking at your life, what do you want? Now, looking at your life, at my life, how would I know that's what you want? How would I know that's what matters the most to you? How would I know those are your values? If I watch the way that you speak to people, not when it's easy, but when it's hard and inconvenient, what would I know about what you want and what you value most? If I watched what you do, not when the deadline is like very swiftly approaching and everything's hanging by a thread, but if I watched what you do in any random day where you could justify just kind of tossing it all, what would I know mattered the most to you? James, just like, <laughs> a little less exposing would be nice. But here's, here's what I want to do. I'm not going to give us like a bunch of tactics for discipline and everything else. My hope is just to, maybe for some of us, where discipline has become this like almost negative term, maybe give us just a little bit of a reframe this morning and a couple of uh, potential next steps. And so I just want to suggest that discipline, though it can be accused of being faithlessly rigid, actually requires great faith. But the concept of discipline may need a slight reframing for our day. There's this guy, Richard Foster. He, he wrote this book in 1978 called The Celebration of Discipline, which I think sounds like an oxymoron, right? Like if, in our culture of quick wins and overnight fame, it might as well be called like the benefits of a hernia. You just go, come on, let's be honest, shall we? Um, it can feel, especially like today, right, like, uh, th- like those two just don't fit, until we really give ourselves over to not just saying what we desire quickly, but shamelessly desiring, getting clear on what we really want, and allowing ourselves to ask the then what question. What would my life look like and feel like if I actually wanted this? If I was actually motivated and compelled and driven by the things I say? And he writes this, and I love it. So you can just sit back and soak this picture in. He said, a farmer is actually totally helpless to grow grain. All she can do is provide the right conditions for the growing of grain. 
insofar as she can control. She cultivates the ground, she plants the seed, she waters the plants, and then the natural forces of the earth take over and up comes the grain. How much grain depends on a combination of things inside and outside of her control. And that's the way it is with discipline. It's the sowing of seed that we do in our lives. It's the preparation of the soil. By itself, disciplines can do nothing. They are dead. They can only get us to the place where something can be done. Discipline requires a vision for what we truly want that is not yet here and a desire to be a person of the quality and the character who is able to take hold of what we want when the conditions are right. Discipline requires a vision for what we truly want that is not yet here. It starts by answering, what do you want? And a desire to be the person, a person of the quality and the character who's able to take hold of what we want when the conditions are right. I just wonder, what might the impact be for us if we understood discipline to be all about preparation for participation in what you and I desire most? What if discipline was about you and I preparing ourselves to participate in the life that you want more than anything. And one of the things that's a constant hiccup, right, is that process almost never comes about naturally or comfortably. We can rarely see the end result until it's really close to being upon us, right? Like it always feels like, oh, I really don't know what this is gonna look like. Maybe it's gonna be something I wanted. I'm not really sure. Is it close? Is it far away? I'm not sure. Oh, it's here. That future, that time when the conditions are right has a way of sneaking up on us and discipline is all about regardless when that time is, will you and I be in a state of readiness? Will we be prepared to participate? but it rarely comes about naturally or comfortably. And that's why discipline born out of desire demonstrates faith in such a powerful way. And so in those moments where I feel like, and maybe some of you have felt this way, like if this were really good, it would be easier. Like if it were really good, if God really wanted this for my life, it would be here already. In those moments where my mind goes there and I find myself in that cycle, I find another one of Jesus' earlier, early followers, Paul's words, to be really comforting. Um, one of my friends, uh, when she first heard this, I think we talked about it in Tuesdays at the chapel one time. I think it was on her mirror for like a year and a half after that. And here's why. He simply says, No discipline feels pleasant at the time. It actually feels painful. What did you expect discipline to feel like, if you're honest? What did you expect the process of getting what you wanted to feel like? I usually expected it to be easier. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of life to the full and peace for those of us who have allowed ourselves to be trained by it. A harvest of full life and peace for those of us who have allowed ourselves to be trained by it. Not shocked by the discomfort of it. And so as we consider where God's moving, and we'll wrap up here, uh, I've observed there's really this movement in a lot of the people that I work with and get to spend time with on a regular basis to re-embrace desire and discipline that brings that Jesus question of what do you want, your deepest desires, our deepest desires to life in the world. There's a ton of classes out there on goals, 
on focusing our gaze, like they said, finding your why. You pay a lot of money for that class, by the way. And by the way, they can be really helpful to get out of a rut. And sometimes we need to get out of a rut. They help you go further in naming your desire than you might by default. And they can be really, really great. I could recommend a lot of them. But for our purposes, I just want to offer a simple consideration for us as we wrap up today. I just want to invite you in the last couple of minutes to just set side by side a few responses for yourself. So you've got, what do I want, hopefully? And then next to it, If you just looked at your own life, if you took a step outside and looked at your life from the outside, are you currently becoming somebody who could participate in that preferred picture of the future? If you looked at who you become and who you're becoming day after day right now, is that the kind of person who could embrace the thing that you want the most? And then right next to that, I want you to write one word. What do you expect it to feel like on your way toward that picture? You can use a phrase. If you want to use bed of roses, that's what I would do. Where, where is it going to be painful? Where can you expect it? Because it will be, certainly, right? If there wasn't some pain to overcome, you'd be there already. And so, last thing, I just want you to capture for yourself is just one response. What's one response over time? Man, if I was disciplined about this, if I was just consistent about this, if I allowed this to shape me and train me over time, what might it be that's top of mind for you that would help contribute to prepare you to be ready to participate in the life that you want. And so, with that wrapping us up, uh, let me just pray and, and then we'll bring the band back up. And so again, an old prayer. We can share it today. So Lord, may we discover faith anew somewhere today. Not shying away from desire, but being bold, curious, and honest. Not allowing ourselves to be distracted from the struggle of long-term becoming and participating by what might promise us a quick win. May we find ourselves like so many who have followed you, standing ready, prepared to participate in what we desire most, finding that our faith has indeed saved us and been a conduit of saving love for so many others along the way. Amen.